Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us. My name is Hiten Samtani. I'm the editorial director at The Real Deal. And uh, we're going to get started with our developers panel. It was a pretty fiery speech from uh, Moshimana. And uh, now we need to talk a little bit more specifics about the market. So it is, it is easy to be a developer in a market which is thriving, right? You're going to get financing very easily. You're going to really push the boundaries of product luxury, amenities, as so many people in this room have done and sold. However, it's a little more challenging, uh, though I, I probably, I dare say, more interesting in a market like this, where there are a lot of conditions to look out for. The experienced people seem to come through it. And then a lot of the fly-by-nighters, the names, the business cards that you got two years ago, they're suddenly selling insurance somewhere, right? So today, we're lucky to have people who've been through the business for many cycles, have seen the ups and downs, and are planning ahead for a future in which Miami is a global destination, but also has to come to terms with what is going on in the economy here and abroad. So I just want to introduce our panelists, and we'll get right into it. To my right is Edgardo de Fortuna. Edgardo is the founder and CEO of Fortune International Group, a leading real estate development and brokerage firm in, in South Florida. Edgardo has seen it all, and, and uh, his smile will tell you a little bit more uh, about that, but he really has seen the ups and downs of the market. He's been there for the crazy times, he's been there for the sordid times, and so Edgardo, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you. On my extreme left is Art Falcone. Art is the CEO and chairman of the Falcone Group, a leading developer in the South Florida area and across the country. And right now, he's one of the developers behind the Miami World Center, which is a 27-acre mixed-use project in downtown. It is transforming the city, and it is essentially one of the models for what large-scale urban development can look like in this region. So Art, thank you for being here. Thank you. And right next to me is David Martin. He is the president and co-founder of Terra Group. They've done about 4.5 million square feet in South Florida. That, that figure might be old, because I think there's another half a million somewhere in there, right? So thank you guys for being with us. I want to just get started. Um, two years ago, uh, the energy in this room is incredible, but two years ago, you could literally hear whooping. Uh, what's going on in the market? Oh, I just sold this. Okay, 2,000 a foot, 2,500 a foot. Boundaries were being pushed. Product was being developed that really was unique for any market, just in terms of how luxurious and over the top it was. Now we're kind of in a phase where we're past the all night party and we're going more to the sit down dinner. So. How do you guys deal with that? Did you guys prepare for the change in the market? It, it, it's not suffering, but it's, it's certainly uh, something you need to think about, right, Gardo? Thank you. First of all, Amir, uh, one advice for you. Next time, either make the, the room bigger or, or keep a secret that I'm going to be on the panel because it's going to be. <laughs> He'll be signing autographs after, right on the right. But this market today is a significantly more mature, I think, than in any market. I, as you say, I've been here for 30 years plus, and uh, I see it a lot more mature in the sense that it's not really significantly going up or significantly going down. It has a really have a, a very soft landing and soft adjustment to, to what the reality of the new market is today. But um, it, and it's a it's uh, significant because Miami is growing as a city um, the, in, in, all, in all terms. So uh, before, in, from 2009 or 8 to 2010, uh, there was basically no development. There was all absorption of existing development from the prior cycle at very low prices. And so nobody developed anything. So we started in 2010 or so, starting development with a with the pent-up demand that we had from the past year. So a lot of the developers here and some outside came and, and started projects. And of course, we went all the other way. I mean, of course, there was a lot of need, a lot of demand, and, and we all thought it was going to last for a very long time. But changing the model, changing the, the, the deposit structure, it has proven that that the market behaves significantly better, both on the financing end and on the marketing and sales end. If you don't sell 50% or 60% of the building and with 50% deposits, nobody started a project because there, was financing, there wasn't financing for that. So that allowed us to, to reduce the leverage on the, on the projects, 
And, and now that the, the market slowed down, you see significantly less new launches of projects, but, but the projects that are under construction that are 60, 70, 80, 90 percent sold continue to do well. I mean, of course, they don't sell 10 or 20 units a month like, like we were doing in two years ago. But, right, but, e but even uh, people who bought land at, at an inflated value, thinking that they were going to get 2,000 a foot or 1,500 a foot, are, are you seeing a lot of people getting burned now? No, I, I think that people are holding for the land because land is a scarce commodity. And so people that are experienced, I mean, and certainly we have them on this panel, are waiting for the right opportunity. And land is going to always behave very well, especially if it's prime land. The, the worst you can do with land is put something in that it doesn't work or, or try to rush into something. So um, I, I always tell the example of, um, when I, when I built Jade, Sing, Jade Brickle, uh, Tibor Hollow bought the land right next to me um, basically at the same time. I, I did very well at, at Jade Brickle and we, we, had, we were very successful, but he did 10 times better in profits and just by selling the land to multiple times and keeping percentages of it. So holding prime land is not a, a sin. I mean, you really, uh, we're, we're all working to try to get the best available properties. But holding land is certainly a smart decision. Art, I wanted to bring you in. Uh, you're, you're doing a 27-acre project in downtown Miami. Obviously, that's not a single cycle project. You're thinking your timeline on that is you know, 10 to 15 years at the minimum. So just, just in terms of what you've seen, how confident are you feeling about the next six or seven years? I, I don't want to get into where we are in the cycle thing, because that's always a crapshoot. But what are you seeing in terms of you're, you're building a spec office tower with, with Heinz, you're doing a hospitality component, major hospitality component. What, what's, your, what's your sense of where we are and are people flying too close to the sun? Um, you know, our philosophy might be a little bit different. We uh, mostly buy and build large mega projects. So we have six projects in the state mm -hmm. that would be the size of cities in essence, where we're spending anywhere between 300 million to 3 billion on each development. So Miami World Center, I'm in, this, I'm in my 14th year. Mm -hmm. By the time we make our first dollar, it'll be the 16th year. So it was always looked at as a long-term vision type of deal. You don't build cities in a 10-year period of time. Uh, so so you know, we look at it as a 25-year cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the key thing to all these developments, we don't use debt. So when we buy land and we develop, we use zero debt. The only time we use debt is on a vertical component. So, so zero debt for the assemblage and the land and any pre-construction? That's correct, okay. yeah, on all our projects in the whole state. Uh -huh. so, so we'll only bring in debt when there's a vertical component from that standpoint. And as Eduardo uh, has, has said eloquently, you know, there's a, a, a ridiculous amount of equity in most people's deals today. So when you look at the amount of equity, like as an example, we had to put into Paramount Tower, mm -hmm. where it was very challenging to get any debt, even if you had no debt, to build the tower itself. You know, in your best case scenario, it was a 50% leverage based on, uh, on cost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we just, I, I have an old saying, there's never a bad real estate deal as long as you have time and no debt. So, and if you think in long-term cycles, you'll make a lot of money and then you live off of your income approach versus? There's not that many people who are fortunate to be in that position. So I, I want to talk about construction financing. But I want to get a sense of the room as well. I, I happen to insult insurance salespeople just before this. So I just want to get a sense. Any insurance salespeople in this house? No, great. Uh, residential brokers. Let me just get a sense of the room for our audience. Commercial brokers? Developers slash aspiring developers? OK, great. So. David, I want to bring you in. Construction financing in this market, um, all of you are, are putting, in, putting in equity, obviously serious equity. But once you have your project, how, how reticent or how, how agreeable are banks to funding things? Because in New York, for example, they've really shied away from providing funds for, for condo projects, for example. Uh, they're thinking about rentals as well. Luxury rentals are having a hard time getting money in some cases. So what are you seeing in, this, in the South Florida market? And if you can talk about any specific projects, that would sure. be good. Uh, so thank you. And uh, I'm honored to be here with Agardo and Art. Um, and me. So yes, and you. Uh, maybe. <laughs> so the, the idea is we're, we're building in uh, 15 different municipalities in Dayton Broward County. Uh, 
We have, uh, we're building, you know, master plan single family communities like Botanico Weston. Uh, we're building uh, uh, shopping centers in Pembroke Pines, office buildings in Coconut Grove, condo buildings in Miami Beach, Coconut Grove. So we, you know, a lot of multifamily garden apartments in Doral as well as in, uh, in West Broward. So, so we've been seeing, uh, we've been executing and implementing a lot of projects post-crisis. Um, I do think that we've been uh, somewhat lucky on, for the last, I would say, uh, five years uh, with a very low interest rate. Uh, uh, that's been a, a huge boom to, to, uh, to, to the real estate business and, and valuations and cap rates. Uh, uh, we're actually selling a shopping center uh, that's closing next month at a sub five cap. So, so the, the, the idea is that um, as any project needs to have strong fundamentals, right? So, um, you know, I think in, in, in every cycle, there's a different time where, where certain projects work or not. For instance, right now, industrial, uh, whether it's spec or pre-leased, is, is getting a lot of uh, interest, a lot of institutional funds, et cetera, are, are really bullish on the industrial sector down here, and I think uh, there's plenty of construction financing for that. Uh, we're just closing next month a multifamily, 400 garden apartments in Pembroke Pines with a, with a local bank uh, that's providing 65% loan to value and, and a very aggressive uh, 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 spread on LIBOR. So, so I think uh, we, you know, two months ago closed our, our vertical construction loan for 87 Park, the Renzo Piano project we're doing in Miami Beach with a bank from, uh, from Singapore, United Overseas Bank, and uh, very good rates. So what, what I think is happening is- Are they competitive to, to what an, uh, an American bank would offer like a B of Yes, actually more competitive. So what we're seeing is obviously there's this uh, interest from the international players to start investing and lending in, in the U.S. And commercial real estate is, is an asset class that I think can still provide stable returns. I think long term we're all dealing with uh, how technology is somewhat disrupting uh, real estate from a retail and office standpoint. Uh, but I do think residential. Uh, we do get our, our supply gluts, you know, here or there. Uh, but I think, uh, like Agardo mentioned earlier, I think since January of 16, there hasn't really been many new projects launched. So I think we're controlling our supply uh, better. And, and, you know, as opposed to last crisis to this cycle, we've, we've been trying to do things where, you know, there's high barriers to entry on the residential side. Um, yeah. How so? What, what sort of barrier? So, so what we see in Miami Beach and Coconut Grove, for instance, is we see very restrictive zoning. So that, you know, or activists or activism, et cetera. And so what that does is it kind of protects the value of your land or of your, of your project uh, from dilution, from competition, right? So you're, you're better positioned in those markets to withstand and more resilient to withstand uh, uh, different uh, supplier demand or currency issues, et cetera. Garda, I want to I want to just talk a little bit about selling luxury real estate. We have we have a lot of residential brokers here. Uh, you recently took over the the Missoni Bay Air project, right? And that's a Vlad Doronin project. So I'm assuming it, it is really going for the global elite, in in a sense. I might be wrong about that, but I I, I think isn't it been a little bit trickier to attract foreign buyers to to Miami at the moment with the currency fluctuations in in you know the dollar getting stronger hurting a lot of Latin American money and buyers coming in. Uh, what, are, what are some of the warning signs for getting foreign money or foreign buyers into the market now? Well, Miami has been very, very attracted to foreign buyers for a very, very long time. Of course, some of the fundamentals in, in the feeder markets that we have, like in Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, have shifted to some extent that the rate of exchange got more difficult for them. And so we need to adjust to that, but also we need to discover new markets, uh, case in point, Turkey, some impact on China, some uh, more activity in the European markets. I was in Italy a couple of weeks ago and seems to be a new resurgence for Europeans to be here. So uh, certainly we have to work a lot harder to make a little bit less money uh, because uh, I, I used to travel in, in my early days of brokerage, I used to travel to, to Latin America all the time to promote Miami first and then to, to try to capture the buyer before they came here because they, when they got here they were too much product and too confused. But now um, 
I am back there because they need to hear from us that, that the market is still very vibrant. I mean, some of, unfortunately, the news usually reports the, the bad news. But, but the reality is, I mean, and we track the market very carefully, the, uh, the perception today in the market is that some of those buildings that are being closed now are half of the, the inventory is back in the, in, the, uh, in the market for sale. That, it's definitely not true. I mean, at maximum, uh, there is 20% on any given building. Mm -hmm. And also, it's, the perception is those resales are losing money. That's definitely not true also. I mean, we, had, we, had a, we did a story about the Porsche design tower in Sunny Isles, where right. I think 22% of the units were back on the market mm -hmm. within six months of closing. But they were marked up at a very high markup, 60%, up to 85% in some cases. So. Right, and, and they're trading, obviously, less than that number, but uh, basically none of, them, of those people lost money. I mean, uh, there's, uh, the buildings that we tracked that I think are 28, only one of the buildings so far in the, in the resale market has lost uh, some value at 1% at or 2%. So, you going to tell us which uh, one? Or? So really, uh, the perception is, is different than the reality. But... Um, but the, going back to your question about getting the customers, of course, they all, still Latin America feels that this is safe, safe heaven and it is uh, very attractive to invest and, and the culture is to invest in, in brick and mortar. So that's not going to change. The, the fact is the perception today is that the urgency is not that, that much anymore. They can wait and they're still going to have some choice units and some pretty good prices. But, um, but how do you explain that the sort of the patience is the name of the game now to, to brokers in the audience who live on volume, who live on sales velocity, and obviously who live on commission? So what kind of conversations are you having? I mean, you've, you're obviously a developer, but you've also owned for a long time one of the most successful brokerages in Miami. You have to go and tell your brokers, hey, listen, hang tight. It's, it's, uh, it's not going to be as much fun as it was the last two years. And it's not, it's not going to be the... the the fun is, is only a part of it, but, but it's, it's a lot more hard work. I mean, uh, obviously, you have to have some good luck, but if you, if you help the luck with hard work, you're going to have a lot more luck. So it, it's really about getting to work every day and, and thinking about what, what am I going to do next to generate my next customer and to service the customer all the way through. Before, it was easy just to show up and somebody showed up at your door. Today, you have to go and look for them. And, and we're really uh, making a big effort participating in all the international fairs, uh, going out to the, the new markets, trying to find ways to, I mean, the task force to try to get a flight directly from, from Asia. So all those efforts contribute to the entire uh, movement of the Miami market, but, but it's, it's up to all of you to, to be able to continue to promote it and to continue to go and get the, because yeah. it's true that today the, the buyer, if, if it's active in the market, can get a, a very good deal. I mean, so um, the, despite the fact that the developers are not reducing the prices, they're giving incentives, they're giving flooring, they're giving whatever they need to be done. So if, if they capture those customers, they can really convert them anyway. Art, I want to bring you and just ask you a question on sort of the institutional level. China, there's, there's the Chinese Party Congress. Uh, President Xi just sort of amassed even more power than he had, and he's one of the most powerful premiers in a long time. Uh, one of his big things has been curbing Chinese capital, Chinese capital control. So he says too much money is going into too much speculative, uh, speculative projects across the world. He specifically has talked about U.S. real estate projects as being a concern. Uh, you had, in the last few years, you had money coming in from H&A, Anbang, all these major Chinese companies were buying up half of New York and L.A. Uh, not sure if Miami saw the same wave, but I think Miami was preparing to see some of that capital come in. Do you think we're still going to see that, or are people adjusting? Uh, you've, you've worked with institutional partners on, on these projects and many others, so I wanted to ask you. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you heard the Chinese leader's speech uh, two weeks ago or a week ago, uh, he has uh, reinforced the fact that uh, he wants Chinese conglomerate companies to be reaching throughout the world, investing money, uh, which America is the number one place for capital. He said uh, that, but he's also specifically talked about U.S. real estate projects. Yes. Speculative projects. What, what we're seeing uh, is, is uh, from the Chinese side, because we're there all the time and we're just opening an office in Beijing right now, so we have boots on the ground. 
we're, we're seeing where before the minimum uh, threshold for uh, Chinese big companies was one billion, like I couldn't even have a conversation with anybody unless they said one billion, one billion of equity, which is you know, hard to invest into one job. Uh, so, so now their uh, focus is under one billion. But it's not like you know, 50 million or something like that. They're, so their world is like they want to invest like 200 million to a billion. I think the leader wanted to people to, uh, his his lead is to be less high profile, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, I don't know why that is. But uh, as an example, you know, right now China for Paramount under um, the leadership of Dan Kadzi and Peggy Fucci is our top three biggest buyer in Paramount. I, I don't know how many other towers or whatever is happening in Miami of how many Chinese buyers there are, but you know, we, we really focused Sorry, there. Sorry, just to clarify, you said Chinese buyers are your third most sort of yes. active buyers in the right. project. So, so, so we're, you know, we're, we, our business is across the whole US, so we spend a lot of time outside of our country uh, visiting different uh, countries capital-wise and bringing buyers here. So China right now is our number three buyer in Paramount out of I think Peggy told me recently we've sold units to people in 46 different countries. So we spent a lot of time going to visit these countries and bringing people to us versus waiting for them to come to us. David, uh, you said you were talking about a big multifamily deal. You're talking about a lot of institutional money coming in. Are you seeing, are you seeing activity from China for what you're doing? Um, I've, I've dealt it and done a few deals with the Hong Kong group, uh, but uh, not from mainland China. Um, but going back to what Edgardo and Art were saying about where the buyers are coming from, I think two things that are unique now uh, that I'm seeing is, number one, I'm seeing kind of the United States kind of having this love affair with Miami now as well. We're seeing buyers in Coconut Grove from New York, uh, Connecticut, et cetera. So, you know, Boston, Chicago. So when we closed our Grand Bay project, uh, I would say we had around 25% of our buyers were kind of American, U.S. based that were relocating and moving to Coconut Grove. Uh, and the second buyer group that I don't think we're, we're talking about is the, uh, the empty nester local. We're seeing a, a big shift in the psychology of people in South Florida wanting to live in, in big homes and big lots. And you know, after, you know, after the kids leave for college, um, you, know, you have a couple that's there sitting with a 12 bedroom house, uh, not knowing what to do with it. So a lot of those buyers uh, are buying from us over at our Park Grove project uh, in Coconut Grove. And so, so I think those two markets are important. As it relates to capital, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of capital, equity, debt on the street right now, um, and I think that's driving a lot of the deals. I think the fact that we have such low interest rates is also maybe uh, creating uh, some of this uh, uh, supply glut maybe in multifamily. But, you know, I think it's, you know, as long as, you know, there's two, two or three things that I think are... Uh, can challenge us in our market. I think number one is if there's anything seriously done about legal immigration, not illegal immigration, but legal immigration. Right now, a lot of our multifamily apartments, et cetera, and rentals are being uh, rented by legal immigrants, people that are working here, that moved here, working here, et cetera. So, so if there's any curb in legislation to that, um, I think that could impact us. And there's, there's been some talk about reforming the H-1B program. I think that that's something that people are concerned about because those tend to be high-paid, skilled workers coming in, eventually getting a green card, eventually become citizens. Right. I mean, the question is reforming may reduce the number of H-1B visas that are given out in a given year, and that's going to impact you know, the coastal markets or the international cities like ours uh, and like Los Angeles or New York. So, so that's one kind of big big issue that, that I think we need to look at. And, and the second thing is obviously these environmental disasters, right? So, so I think, um, you know, I was at the ULI uh, yesterday in LA for a conference, and so a lot of the discussion was about resiliency and how cities and communities can, you know, bounce back from these, uh, these storms. And I think, you know, what Art's doing, what Agardo's doing, what we're doing, what others are doing, we're creating a huge tax base for our city and municipalities. And how those, fun, how those funds are going to be allocated to make our city more resilient to water, uh, to decentralizing power, these are things that I think are going to, that we need to start investing in and we need to start promoting with our elected officials in order to kind of really be able to compete long term 
because uh, uh, these uh, the frequency of these events and the uh, and and the the intensity of these events, you know, having back to back, you know, Cat Five storms, etc. I think those cities that are going to be able to withstand this, I think, the strongest. I mean, after Hurricane Andrew, Miami-Dade County brought the entire country uh, the strongest building code for wind. And I think, you know, I was in Dallas, for instance, and, and they were differentiating, you know, good quality built homes and bad quality built homes by if they were complied to the Miami-Dade code. I think now we need to really show the world, and there's a lot of uh, individuals at the county and city now working on planning our neighborhoods to be able to withstand we, we a lot a of the what. We have those you know. in our panel at 2.15, so please join us for that. Right. I, I'm glad you brought up the environmental question because when people see something like an Irma hit Miami and how, de how it devastated South Florida in general, does that have an effect on the market? Does it have a cooling short-term effect on the market? Wait, I don't want to be there. Um, I'm very happy in New York or somewhere inland where I where I know I'm safe, where I know my investment is protected, well, what's and where I'm not fleeing. Yeah. What's interesting, what happened with Irma, from a lot of friends that I have, everybody that was traveling to the Caribbean are now coming to Miami. So that was a good thing, right? But the bad thing is what happened to the Caribbean and what's going on in Puerto Rico, which is pretty sad. Um, I think most of the interesting cities have environmental issues, right? In LA and, and that whole area, a lot of them were talking about these fires, right? And, and the fires and, you know, that, are, uh, that are significantly occurring you know, right now. And the second thing in California is earthquakes. The fact that Sandy hit New York, the fact that you know, other storms hit Houston, other storms hit the Carolinas, is, I think the entire coast is really vulnerable to this. But it's really a question of what are cities doing to invest, right? We have the strongest building codes. I think we bounce back pretty, pretty quickly from this storm. Uh, the question is, what can we do to, like, for instance, from a power standpoint? So we, because there's a lot of economic dis disruption that that occurs with these storms, and and so a lot of small businesses can't really survive without power for two or three weeks. So, so we need to work together with uh, Florida Power and Light to try to come up with some creative solutions like renewables and and de you know solar panel microgrids and stuff like that. Since we're on the question of government, uh, I wanted to ask you about something we chatted off stage which is uh, the Treasury Department is, uh, has recently been trying to crack down on what they call dirty money. And a lot of that money happens to find itself in a, in a glitzy apartment on the beach in Miami or in a penthouse in New York. So what they've done is they're trying to track buyers and they've recently expanded what they're looking at. Uh, my question for you is, uh, is that having an impact on the market or is it just more uh, money for the lawyers and the paperwork? For now, it seems that it's not affecting Miami basically at all. The, the original regulation was based on either cash or, or cashier's checks. It didn't include wire transfers. So it, it, in our market, Basically, most purchases. Right. 100% um, of the purchases were basically by wire or people have the money here already. So it, it really has a very little impact. Most of our projects in the higher end, people have banking relationships already in the U.S., so the transfers are not even from the, from the foreign banks to here, but rather directly. But what about a first-time wealthy buyer coming in, um, has a lot of cash, or, and wants to put it in somewhere, but may not have the infrastructure in place? The way you're talking about again, uh, the, if the cash is uh, properly obtained and there's no not issues, uh, he shouldn't worry at all. It's a little bit more of bureaucracy, but I, I don't see a significant impact uh, at all in, in into that effect from the new regulations. So, what what factors are what factors are you worried about then? And, and you've got you've got the equity, so that doesn't seem to be an issue. What what are you looking down the road and saying? Hey, this is something that I need to prepare for either move into a new market or adjust my strategy in this market? Art. I mean, we look at a lot of things. Um, we always follow the Fed, because uh, obviously that affects interest rates. So um, as an example, you know, what the F Fed fund rate is, uh, what, one to quarter today? Um, so, you know, we, we see that going up about 75 basis points over the next 12 months, uh, which will affect cap rates. So if you're building retail or hotels or um, apartments like we do, affects short term your value. So you, you always have to make sure that you're building at the right spread and not going too close to what people believe the cap rates are going to be for the next 10 years, which will not be the case. So, you know, a, th these lower interest rates could put a lot of developers and lull them to sleep and then really forget that, 
uh, you know, when, when I start hearing this is a new paradigm or it's different this time, then I, I know we're kind of getting to the end because everybody's drinking the, uh, the, 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 uh, the soup uh, and it's going to come more to an end because it's never such thing as a new paradigm or it's different this time. Human behavior has been the same way for thousands of years. So, so uh, that employment growth and wage growth uh, is really key right now. Um, un unemployment growth has been fantastic over the last eight years, uh, but we need wage growth. Uh, we're finally seeing that in the last year. Uh, so with wage growth, obviously, you have more uh, rising prices. But however, when you have rising prices, you have inflation. So, and that creates interest rates to go up as well. So uh, we look at all those different things, and we have a trained person in our office that's our, my partner. That's what all he thinks about, and he tells me all that bad stuff every so day. So Nitin just looks at charts all day, is that what you're saying? Basically, yes. David, you have the same question for you. Just macroeconomic factors that you're looking at right now that are something that people should think about here. Brokers as well, because yeah, uh, brokers tend to be very reactive, and I think the people who will succeed in the next couple of years are the ones who are a little bit more well-prepared. Yeah, I think, uh, uh, like Art said, rates are an important driver of our business. Uh, I think uh, Miami as a city, uh, it's investments that it makes, right? Uh, you know, and how competitive we are. At the end of the day, you know, states compete with states, cities are competing with cities. You're seeing it right now for the Amazon headquarters, et cetera. So how can we make our city more resilient? How can we make it more uh, interesting? How, how can we provide a better life, better education? Do you These want are the Amazon headquarters here? Is that something you would, uh, it's 238 cities bid for this. It's crazy. It's one company. It's a $5 billion project. $50, but, but, but like Amazon, there's, a, there's, there's several other companies uh -huh. that are looking at expansion. And, uh -huh. you know, I think Miami's diversity uh, and kind of it being a global city kind of un uniquely positions it. I think I saw there was some, there was a betting site that was had Atlanta and I think Austin as the two top cities. But again, how do we become those top cities that corporate, corporate relocations that people want to come to our city? What do we have to do? What do, do we need more grad students, for instance, in our, you know, how are universities, you know, fostering more graduate students and growing and expanding and, and increasing the amount of offerings that they have in order so that we can have a, a you know, a str smarter uh, community and a more intellectual. My, my question, though, is more specific. So you saw how all these cities are courting Amazon. Do you think it's a good idea for cities like Miami to go after a company to that level? Because the Empire State Building turned orange for Amazon. It's, it's, is there no sense of desperation in, in, a, in a trick like that? I, I don't think it's desperation. Why wouldn't we compete? I mean, I think, uh, you know, I have a lot of pride in our city, and, and uh, you know, we don't have the Empire State Building, but, you know, we have other qualities and other, other benefits and, and, and natural qualities. I think, you know, what makes a healthy, beautiful city is not only you know huge towers, right? It, it's also about the natural environment. Two thirds of Miami-Dade County is in a you know this natural aquatic park, right? I mean, you know the the quality of life people get here, I think, is uh, is amazing, and I think the 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 interface with so many different cultures and the fact that you know there that anyone from any any part of the world, one of the secrets of Miami is that anyone here can feel at home. You could come from Russia, you could come from Argentina, you could come from New York, and you. you you could come from China, and you know, in the next in three or six months, you could really make Miami feel like your home. So, so I think our ability to be open to diversity and, and open to to new individuals and new companies, I think, is important. But I do think we have an uphill battle. I mean, we do have a great airport, we have a great seaport. Those are important elements. I think the fact that we're the capital of Latin America, a lot of these tech companies do want to expand and grow in those emerging markets. So I do think we got to position ourselves better and smarter, and I think we got to work with our elected officials so that uh, when when these corporate relocations are happening, you know, Atlanta's not taking them all the time. I think Miami's, it's really Miami's time, as Edgardo said, earlier, we're now becoming more mature, more serious, uh, more institutional, and I think the more we do that, the more we could, uh, you know, really try to grab the, the best companies to I, come here. I think you should run for office. There. <laughs> if there's any uh, Jeff Bezos spies here, please come and speak to David after. We'll take two questions, and we got to wrap up. Two questions. And it has to be a question, sir. Go ahead. 
That's a great question. I'll repeat it uh, for the audience. So the question was, have any of you taken cryptocurrencies? Would you accept Bitcoin or God knows what other variations? And uh, how has that worked if you have done that? No, yet. I mean, I don't. I don't think that we are equipped to to get it done. But I'm, I don't totally discard it in the future. I I've seen very creative listings that that are offering accepting those type of uh, alternative currencies. But and and I don't think that uh, people. Some people that are really fanatics believe that it's the the way it's going to replace the entire uh, monetary system. But I I'm a little bit less. Uh, optimistic about that, but but I think that it could become a, a good player. There there is some fundamentals of what's backing that up that is concerning to me, but but I don't see it very prevalent in the market. Would yet. you ever take it as a construction deposit? <laughs> you know, twenty percent real cash, ten percent. Uh, we're not that desperate yet. I mean, uh, <laughs> I I think that uh, it, it's all going to be dictated by by the financial institutions or or whoever your capital partners are. I, it's still way, way too early to tell, but, but it's, a, it's a pretty interesting way of, of looking at things, and we'll see. I mean, uh, maybe in the, the next couple of years on the panel, we'll, we'll talk about it more, uh, uh, more we'll, seriously about it. We'll take one more question. So the lady in the back uh, with the glasses. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for being here and giving us so much information. I'm originally from Argentina, and I used to sell a lot to Latin American clients. So we're trying to capture this market again. What will be from you the best um, suggestion, or how can we really get these clients back when I really feel right now in these markets they're finding local opportunities, and we see a little bit of um, like not very open mind to come back to Miami until the prices adjust. Thank uh, you very much. I mean, well, okay, two part. Uh, so the, the question was, how do we bring how do we bring the Latin love back to Miami? Well, Correct. In in Miami today, you have the best combinations possible. I, I'm going to use my my building J signature as an example of of what it is. But David can pick up any of his buildings and probably the same thing and same thing with art. But uh, in J signature, you have some of the best architects in the world in Herzog and De Moron. The best interior designer in the world is Pierre Brochon. A great team and very, very functional, spectacular units. Uh, so there is product here in Miami that uh, I travel all over the world and, and really doesn't compare with the exception of very, very few cities. So in Latin America, they don't see that. They don't have that. And obviously in Miami, you still have the safety of the US system, both in, uh, in security, physical security and economic security uh, that don't have in those, those specific countries. So, so you, you just need to keep showing them. And again, as I said before, work hard to be able to display all the beauties of, of Miami and the different products that, that they have available for everybody's needs. Art, I'll let you have the last word, please. Well, I love Miami. It's my favorite city in the world. So uh, we keep on convincing people to come to Miami. And we need more intellectual capital and in working with universities and create Miami to be more of a technology hub, not just a great place for no taxes and great weather. But meanwhile, you can bring your clients to our project in Orlando. So, <laughs> I, I want to I wanna thank you guys, first of all, for listening and being such a great audience. And then I want to thank our panelists as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, guys.